I'm going to read a psalm. It's number 96. And I think it's one that uh, is reasonably well known, but it's, it's not usually anybody's favorite. Number 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resign and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord. For he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his truth. You know, it's amazing the things that come to your mind just when you're, <laughs> when you're reading the scripture, you know. But Spurgeon, I'm not sure whether um, Ryan quoted him this morning or not. But he was commenting on this particular psalm. And he said something that caught my mind. He says, there are mighty passions of the human soul which demand expression and give no relief until they find their way out. And of course, you know, he was spot on. Donna will know this because of the ministry that she leads with uh, Stacy Ray and Natalie. Deep grief. Deep grief can destroy the mind if it's not released and washed away in tears. I think all of us know this. Love and passion, likewise, can break a heart. They can even drive you crazy if it can't find fulfillment. So it is with true religion. So it is with true religion. For true religion not only takes hold of the intellect, appealing as it does to our judgment and our understanding, but it also grips our emotions. I mean, I'm hoping it grips yours. And it fires our emotions up with a holy zeal. And when the Spirit of the Lord gets hold of our lives and releases himself inside of us, because that's what he does, you know, when he births us into the family of God and he regenerates us, he brings us into the Christian family and he infuses us. In fact, better than that, he comes to live within us. And we must give vent to our joy. We can't just keep it in. I want to tell you something, everybody. I just got saved. What's for dinner tonight? Have you ever been up on the foothills in the height of summer and looked at the mountain streams? The water barely trickles down its pathway, laying bare the gravel that used to be under, deep under the water. In some places, there's hardly a sign that a stream ever ran there. But how different is it in the winter time when the snows melt and the blue mists have turned to rain? Then the water comes down, cascading 
down the mountain in a mighty turn and it's splashing and in the splashes it's actually expressing its energy and its vitality as, as it often brooks its own boundaries. When that happens, there's never any doubt that this is the path of a real and living stream. So it is with true religion. Its Christianity cannot hide itself. The very effervescence of its godliness must make itself visible and must make itself plainly known. And that's, that's what this song is saying. That's the essence of this song. The writer is so filled with the joy and delight of God's greatness and God's goodness in his own day that he can't keep himself from breaking into song. And if you know your Old Testament, you will be aware that historically, this song was written by David and it was first sung on the occasion when the Ark of the Covenant was brought up to Jerusalem and placed in a sacred tent that had been prepared for it. And if you're in any doubt about that, you'll read it for yourself in First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 23. Now, here in Psalm 26, what you've got to understand is it's a prophetic song. It looks forward. Yes, there are fulfillments partially of the truths that are in it, but it's looking forward to the ultimate fulfillment of the words. And it's a prophetic song of triumph which celebrates a coming time when the nations and the people groups of the world will sing this song. And not only will they sing the song, the reason they'll sing it, of course, is the greatness and goodness of God, but they'll also rejoice in God's salvation. We often hear people say this, I want to say it myself and I want to say it tonight. Look, let me tell you something. There's nothing in me that God would want me. Nothing. There's nothing that I could have done to make myself whole and a Christian. God did everything that I or anyone else could never do to make me acceptable to God. And that all comes to me and anyone who is a Christian, it comes through what Jesus has done. And that's why there's no occasion for boasting. You know, who are we to stand up here two and a half feet above contradiction or for you to sit with one another and think that somehow or other you, you're more blessed or better than anyone else. We're all of us beggars when it comes to the matter of grace. And it's always a good thing to remember that in your Christianity and in your preaching, Ryan. This is a gospel song. It's a missionary song. It's an old song. It says sing a new song, but this is actually an old song as far as the Jews were concerned. But it is one that will be ultimately and fully become a new song for all the redeemed of the Lord. It's not a Jewish song. It's not a Baptist song. It's not a Methodist song. It's not a Presbyterian or a Charismatic or a Pentecostal or a Churches of God song. This is a new song for all the redeemed of the Lord. And by application, and always remember that, you know, I'm a Christian and I happen to be a Baptist and I'm, 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 I'm a Baptist by conviction. But you know what? God has his people in all kinds of places. And the God's honest truth is they may have differences with us. But let me tell you, where you meet a man or woman, boy or girl, whose heart and faith is with Jesus Christ, you're meeting someone who is a brother or a sister in the Lord. And we shouldn't, maybe not so much here, but when I was in Georgia, man, if you weren't a Southern Baptist, you weren't anything. It was a bit like ripping. You know, if you're not Dutch, you're not much. It's not what they say. But this is an old song for Jews, but it's ultimately and fully now become a new song for all God's people. And by application, because that's what I'm doing now, 
it well expresses a joy of a soul who has found salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying to you that when the Jews before Christ's coming read this psalm, they thought, oh, that's it. You know, Jesus Christ is coming and he's going to save us. Not at all. And that's what makes this a prophetic psalm because it needs further development and further explanation and fulfillment. It's a joy that causes the man or woman who has found faith in Christ to burst out into song and proclamation, not just song, but proclamation of the greatness of God and the wonder the wonder of his salvation. Look, I, I, I don't know what you're thinking, but I, I do, especially at communion. Sometimes when I'm here and I'm the guy who's at the table, what you might say, officiating at the table, sometimes I have to think to myself, what am I doing here? What am I doing here celebrating this? Because I'm always aware my sins are always before me. You know, I have to say that to you, but don't think ill of me because one of the outworkings of that is this. It drives me to God continually to confess my sins and to receive his forgiveness and his cleansing. But it's amazing to me that God would take an interest in someone like me, and, and I don't want to be too personal, but someone like you as well. I mean, who here could stand up and say, well, you don't know about me. I'm such a wonderful person. It's maybe just as well. We don't know about you, you know. But it's a proclamation also of the greatness of God and the wonder of his salvation. But please note something well. Now listen to this because it's really important in the times in which we live and the plural modern secular age that we live in. This new song is a song for God alone. A song for God alone. The songs which once celebrated and exalted Jupiter and Neptune and Allah and Buddha and Vishnu and Shiva, they're silenced forever. You will never hear a song of jubilation and a joy of praise in heaven for any of those names because those gods are simply idols. They're not gods at all. This song is dedicated to the Lord Almighty alone. And you see, brothers and sisters, and this, what I was trying to get at earlier when I was, you know, spewing out all those words. The cross of Jesus reveals the very hearts of his people. It's the cross. The cross is the center of everything. It was not it will be and it always will be. There, who's going to be going to see in heaven? A lamb, a slain. And it reveals the true character of God's people. I know that because it wasn't until the cross was set up that anything was ever heard of Joseph of Arimathea. Did you ever read about him in Matthew chapter 1 or Mark 1 or Luke 1 or John? Of course you didn't. It wasn't until the cross that Nicodemus came out of the closet and stood four square with the cause of Christ. Until the cross of Jesus, he remained silent in the Sanhedrin, secretly admiring the great Redeemer, but all hush, hush. But when the cross was lifted up, Joseph came out of the woodwork to publicly offer his tomb, and Nicodemus broke a silence and came forward with great generosity to provide spices and linens for the body of Jesus. You see, the cross brings out into the open the inner thoughts and the inner passions of the heart. And the point that I'm trying to make this evening from this ancient scripture is this. If you and I have real grace and true love in our souls for the Lord Jesus, we will demand, we will demand some way of expressing our joy and our consecration to God. This song is a great universal song that proclaims the ultimate sovereignty and grandeur and lordship of the creator of everything and the redeemer. And this song suggests not one but two ways 
of expressing our devotion and joy in God and His Savior. And the first I've already kind of said a lot about. We can express our devotion, our joy in God by singing about it. By singing about it. Now, I'm glad you're all sitting down. And I don't purposely want to grieve anybody. But there's no point in me standing up here and saying, you know, a lot of hyperbole and all of that. If I don't ground it and I don't point out things that are very obvious. There is something in our church. Let's not worry about the folks next door or down the street that I cannot understand. Why there are people who do not sing with the congregation. I don't understand it. And why some others are so lethargic and dull in their singing. Let's sing a really happy song. Oh, happy day. I'm not a bad singer, I'm not a good singer, but I hope you've noticed I open my mouth and I give it every bit of breath I have in my lungs. And I don't care who hears me or who doesn't like it. Some people have informed me they can't carry a tune in a bucket. I say, don't worry about that, just make a joyful noise with as much volume as you are able without embarrassment. Now listen to this. Some have actually told me they don't sing because they like to concentrate on the words. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Think what heaven will be like if all the saints and angels and the living creatures take that view and we come to sing that new song in glory. That's why I don't understand it. But listen, it's one thing to sing about the greatness of God and his salvation. But it's also something that we are to talk about. Something we must tell the whole world about. Yes, by singing. But sing to the Lord all the earth. And by telling. Verse 3. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous deeds among all peoples. Verse 7, ascribe to the Lord, O family of nations. Verse 9, tremble before him all the earth. Verse 10, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. We say amen to that, Marianne. Listen. He will judge the peoples with equity. Now, when I am reading this psalm, when we get to verse 11, we begin to see the climax of this singing and proclamation and declaring and telling. Because from verse 11 onward, the whole of creation is in the choir of exaltation. Did you hear what I read? Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resign and all that's in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the trees will... I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful being up in the midst of the forest and the trees all bursting into song? Then he says, all creation will sing. And what's the reason for this universal exaltation? Well, God's certainly worth it, Henry, but that's not the reason. Because the psalmist tells us, because the Lord comes. Because the Lord comes. He comes to judge the earth and the world in righteousness and peoples of the world. Listen, in his truth. I was actually writing a, a, a paper for someone else about truth today and, and the postmodern culture and the death of truth but when Jesus comes we'll see the complete fulfillment of this song for all creation will be under the jurisdiction of this great savior and judge and everyone who has ever lived will be summoned to appear before his bar 
And Christ Jesus himself, no one else, Christ Jesus himself will determine all matters. And there'll be no bribery. And there'll be no corruption there. It will be his truth, his honesty, his veracity, his integrity that will rule from the bench. And that's really important. I get sick when people are made foul of one and meat of another, you know? It's terrible when you see one group of people or one person being favoured above others. It's just not fair. No nation will be favoured. No prejudice will be shown. All the peoples of the, co the continents will be tried by the same justice and the same measure. Justice will be finally done. And every living soul will know that the Lord is God indeed. What a song to sing. What a story to tell. What a day for everyone in Christ. For everyone in Christ to look forward to. A day when this song will be sung in all its glory. When the Lord Jesus Christ is seated on his throne in all his glory. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, Lord of lords. And King of kings. And I'm on good ground. I can assure you that I have confidence that that's exactly what that psalm is pointing us forward to. And you read it over yourself. And if you disagree, let me know. I'll be happy to listen to you. But it's a prophetic psalm. It makes use of a song that meant something to the Jews of old. But here in the psalm, it's a song that is to be fulfilled in generations to come and then ultimately fulfilled at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? I'm just, well, I, I don't know. Marianne says she can't wait. I, I don't know if I could say that because uh, that's one of the kind of paradoxes or whatever with me. You know, if the sky were to separate tonight, I would be frightened. I'd be frightened. If the stars and the planets were to fall out of space and control was, was, was not there any longer, I would be frightened. I, I want you to know that. I, I don't want to bluff anybody. You know, as I've said often, if I was out walking my dog at night and the heavens parted and I saw... Uh, legions and legions and thousands upon thousands of angels who are celestial beings of great beauty and power and glory and at their head was Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. You know, the dog and I would run home and we, I, my wife and I have a Doberman Pinscher. I can assure you I would beat the dog home <laughs> and the first thing I would do would be to change my underwear because the sight is awesome. And I'm a man of sinful lips. I know I'm a Christian. I know I'm going to heaven. But I have an awe of God in all his glory. Because the sight of the glory of Jesus Christ coming in the clouds. There won't be anyone who will be standing up and patting him on the back and say, Oh, great to see you, chummy. And I've often thought about those tears in heaven. God will wipe away all tears. I've heard many people say many things about what those tears are. From my point of view, the way I see it, as it applies to me, the tears that God will wipe from my eyes are the tears of regret and disappointment and sadness that I didn't take every opportunity that God had given to me. But thanks be to God, we'll sing that new song. 
and we will be redeemed. We don't need to fear punishment, the lake of fire, hell, or anything like that. Because what Jesus Christ has done for us has been absolutely phenomenal. And he is the only one who could achieve it. So, there we are. I'm talked out. So let's sing the last hymn. And then let's go home. And uh, if you look up on the way home and you see the clouds parting...